Hello and welcome to the Experiential Learning at Chicago Kent webinar. I'm Nicole Vilches, Assistant Dean for Admissions, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Chicago Kent offers a wide array of opportunities for students to gain practical experience during law school and build their lawyering skills. During today's panel, we'll provide you with an overview of these opportunities and then give you a chance to answer questions, ask questions of your own. Our panelists today are uh, Professor Jennifer Robbins, Director of Experiential Learning and Senior Lecturer. As the Director of Experiential Learning, Professor Robbins leads the law school's Innovative Praxis Program, which offers students an experience-based course of study to help them prepare for real-world legal practice. Before joining the Chicago Kent faculty, Professor Robbins was General Counsel of a global consulting firm focusing on commercial real estate and financial services industries, where she managed all legal affairs, including strategic counseling, transaction evaluation and execution, and risk management. Justice David Erickson, Director of the Trial Advocacy Program, Co-Director of the Program in Criminal Litigation and Senior Instructor. In August of 2006, Justice Erickson retired as Justice of the Illinois Appellate Court, 1st District, and accepted a position as a Senior Lecturer and Director of Chicago Kent's nationally ranked Trial Advocacy Program. Since 1983, Justice Erickson has served as a Faculty Advisor and Coach for Chicago Kent's National Trial Advocacy Team. Under his guidance, the law school has captured many regional and national honors, including four national championships in 1988, 2007, 2008, and 2015 at the National Trial Competition. And Professor Richard Gonzalez, Clinical Professor of Law and Director of Clinical Education. Professor Gonzalez joined the Chicago Kent faculty in 1988 and was appointed Director of Clinical Education in 2015. He's a frequent speaker and author on the topics of employment dis discrimination and wrongful discharge. In 2013, Professor Gonzalez was inducted into the College of Labor and Employment Lawyers, the organization recognizing the nation's top labor and employment attorneys. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to our panelists, and we'll begin with Professor Robbins. Uh, so I want to welcome you today. Um, we're excited to be able to talk to you about the experiential offerings here at Chicago Kent. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction, Nicole. Uh, so I am relatively new to the law school. We have uh, very long tenured faculty members here. People seem to like Chicago Kent um, and spend some time here. Uh, I've only been here about three years which uh, I think makes me still maybe objective enough to uh, tell you many of the things that I've enjoyed about the law school and the experiential, experiential approach that I think uh, the law school has. Um, and specifically, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the certificate programs here at Chicago Kent. So as an institution, we have about 12 different certificate programs that allow you to focus your legal studies. Um, people sometimes think of them as similar to a major, uh, but optional. Uh, I won't list them all, but they cover areas like business law, labor and employment, um, uh, intellectual property, compliance. And legal education is a really flexible and wide ranging uh, sort of education in the same way that a doctor might be in general practice or cardiology or brain surgery. Um, you know, lawyers have a variety of different career options in terms of specialty. And certificate programs give you a chance to explore an area of law in detail, uh, gives you a selling point in job interviews, uh, and gives you uh, one more close contact in terms of a faculty member who is knowledgeable in that area and perhaps even can help you build your network. So certificates can be a tremendous help uh, even if you don't ultimately go into that specific uh, practice area. One thing that Chicago Kent has done that I think is very unique in the nation uh, I'm not aware of any other program like it is that we have a certificate program that spans across all legal subjects and is a certificate in experiential learning. We call it Praxis, um, a little bit of an unusual name, but when you think of Praxis, just think practice. Uh, and it is 
uh, for students who really want to prepare for their career in an experiential uh, sort of way. So it's not about one area of law, uh, it's about mastering all of the legal skills that lawyers need. So um, oral negotiation skills, uh, problem solving, project management, uh, networking, you know, legal writing. And you might be surprised to learn that if you don't really focus on skills, it is very possible, in fact, perhaps even likely, uh, that you could graduate from almost any law school in the nation um, with a lot of knowledge, a lot of understanding of the law, but never actually having done the things that lawyers do. And so you might think about the difference between studying a subject like civil procedure, the rules of the court, and then thinking about how different that is from actually being in a courtroom. It's that sort of difference that we focus on in praxis. Um, so I want you to be advising clients, negotiating, trying out uh, taking a deposition. You'll hear a lot more about those kinds of skills today. Uh, and what Praxis does is you go through a guided assessment, uh, trying to make sure at every step of your law school career that you've experienced those skills and that you've decided um, whether you enjoy doing those activities. And it allows you to think then about what sorts of careers in the law might be fulfilling to you based on whether or not you would use those particular skills more often uh, than in another area. Um, but whether or not you're interested in praxis specifically, uh, there are, you know, there's a number of things to like about sort of the certificate process. Um, you're going to hear from Judge Erickson um, and from my colleague, Professor Gonzalez, uh, more about uh, the clinic um, and about some of our amazing trial advocacy programs. Uh, but I wanted to touch on just a couple things outside Praxis that are uh, experiential. One is the opportunity to engage in those activities in your coursework. Uh, so we have a number of courses that are experiential. So in my high professional responsibility class, we talk about ethics and negotiation, and then I actually have students engage in a negotiation that I have sort of assimilated and has some ethical landmines in it. Um, you know, we have classes in negotiation. So we have many different, um, you know, opportunities actually in the classroom uh, for experiential coursework. In addition, uh, we have externships and, you know, we uh, would just be remiss not to touch on the fact that given our location in Chicago, we're very fortunate that we have many different internship and externship opportunities right at our doorstep, uh, which allows students also to uh, take for credit, um, you know, an ex externship uh, that will actually place them in, uh, in the courts, uh, in a government agency, uh, you know, in a variety of different settings where you would actually get uh, legal experience and would be trying out those skills. So I'll defer to my other colleagues, uh, but that's just a little taste of uh, some of what we'd like to talk to you about today. Great, and now we'll turn things over to Judge Erickson to talk about our uh, trial advocacy program. Well, good afternoon. Um, and we covered, you just got an awful lot covered in terms of, of what we do, in terms of the different programs. This, the trial ed program is, is unique at Chicago Tech. Um, I have been involved with it since 1983. It's one of the oldest in the country, if not the oldest, um, for a law school. It started in 1981 by Justice Warren Wolfson. I came on board in 83 and when I was a prosecutor um, and started teaching there. Uh, it's structured in a way for those who want to be in court in either civil litigation or criminal litigation, um, to be a public defender, a state's attorney, a guardian, private defense lawyer, um, to be a plaintiff's lawyer, an insurance defense lawyer, any kind of litigator at all, commercial litigation, all of it falls under the program. Uh, the structure for it, for those um, students that come through, and I can say this, it's probably the most popular elective in the school, 
about 80% of all graduates take at least one course. There's a basic trial at one course that meets once a week. It meets in one of our two courtrooms at the law school. It meets at night or it meets in the morning or um, it meets at the Daily Center, which is the downtown courthouse on either Monday or Tuesday nights. Uh, the basic course will give you a, a bench trial in the middle of the semester for a midterm, a jury trial at the end of the semester. The courses are three hours long. Um, we hold it down to usually eight people, uh, an eight to one ratio for your professors. They're taught by uh, alumni, uh, very skilled trial lawyers that, um, and experienced trial lawyers that I usually uh, select uh, from a, a whole pool of adjuncts that, that really want to come in and play, be part of our program. Um, after that, there's a trial ed tour or an advanced course. The advanced course is not as much fun for the instructors, but it's a lot more fun for the people taking it because you would go through a review session for the first few weeks, and then after that, you do five trials, and the, uh, complete trials, all juries and um, with a partner, and you do everything. You do, a, you do criminal trials, you do civil trials. It's a mix to give you a good feel of how, it, how, it, how it's done. You're graded and evaluated personally. You're critiqued personally um, based upon you, not, not a curve of the class, not comparing you to someone else, because trial advocacy is something that's unique to every trial lawyer as, as you go along. We also came up with, now some 20 years ago, one of the first litigation technology classes. Um, in the country. Uh, I think we were only the, the second or third law school to have one at the time. Many law schools have them now. And we have trained at least 12 law schools in how to do a litigation technology course. It is today. It's not the future. It's today. It's how technology now fits into every federal courthouse in the country where you walk in and, and presentations are done uh, on screens. Witnesses are brought in and, and Skyped in from different places. Um, demonstrations for your demonstrative evidence, your real evidence uh, can be put up there. Your depositions for impeachment can all be put on the screens. It's a dynamic course, um, and it's a course that's aimed at putting us into the present, in, into 2020, into 2020 and, and then 2021. It's changed constantly. Um, it was invented here. Uh, it, you can, by the time you're done, as you see when you look at the, the photograph, of the trophy cases, just to the right of that was the courtroom you saw at the beginning, which is the Cohen courtroom. That is a completely high-tech courtroom. It has two 90-inch screen televisions on it. Each of the council table has an iPad built in. You can, you can actually run your entire case from that council table. There are um, Elmo's built into the ceiling, so you can slide over your document or your piece of evidence. It'll be projected on the screen. The judge sitting on the bench has a control panel that controls all nine stations in the courtroom electronically. It is as advanced as any courtroom in the country, any real courtroom in the country. Um, in addition to the litigation, after litigation technology, we took the next step last year, and the next step was something just called digital evidence. Um, it is right now a cutting edge type of evidentiary presentation that judges around the country are starting to have to learn how to do. What's it about? It's about getting the information out of the cell phone. It's about how to get a warrant for a cell phone or a computer or any kind of electronic device. It's how to store those things, how to compile those things, how to challenge them in the courtroom, how to write your motions, how, what to look for and how to look for it. It's, it teaches you forensically how to go after information to build a case. Um, it's taught by a, a circuit court judge named William Hooks and a, and a professor here at the law school. Together they teach it. Um, after, from there on, we, we try to develop um, tethered courses that fit into today's world. We have a domestic violence course that focuses on how to prosecute and how to defend domestic violence cases in, in the world today. Um, we have a trial evidence seminar course that just meets during the summer. It meets four nights a week. It's a lot of work. It meets for seven weeks, and it's the application of raw evidence right to the courtroom at one particular time um, with one particular type of of evidentiary problem every week. Uh, when students come, by the time students are through it, um, they've been immersed in the most complete evidence program, I think, in the country. Uh, 
Also, we've tried a, a brand new course. It's very successful. It's seven years old now. It's called Ethics and, uh, Ethics and Advocacy. Um, it takes an underlying case of attorney malpractice, and from the beginning of the semester to the end, you go through the traditional ethical, uh, the ethical guidelines, uh, and then you apply them to a case, and you're given a side. You're either defending the lawyer or you're prosecuting the lawyer for the government. Um, and at the end, you actually try that case. It, it served, the Illinois Supreme Court has recognized it as a, a filling a requirement for the ethics requirement for the Illinois Bar. Um, let me just talk about the second for now, the second component of our program, and that, of course, is our trial advocacy teams. Um, the teams are the heart of, of advocacy at the law school, there's no question. Every year, we put out five or six teams in the fall and five or six teams in the spring. Um, there are many different invitationals that we've been invited to around the country. Uh, during the course, as was mentioned earlier, we've won four national championships um, at the uh, national trial competition, which is kind of like the NCAA basketball tournament. 200 schools start, they will lit down to 24, then they will lit down to eight and then four, and then one champion standing. It's a very difficult thing to win. Uh, during that time, we have won 30 plus regional championships for being the regional best team in the Midwest year after year. Uh, our ranking currently is number five in the country. Um, we have been ranked in the top 10 for over the last 20 years. Uh, it is definitely uh, a program that, that bases itself not on just being good or getting there, but on excellence. I can promise you that when you leave the program, if, you've, if you're on the trial team, um, you're probably a good five years ahead of your, your colleagues coming out of law school and how to handle yourself with clients in a courtroom. We try, and, we, and as I said, we have these other courses to try to work it in together uh, in a kind of a tethered fashion. Um, with that, uh, we also, um, the, oh, the course, I'm sorry, and our teams are co coached by alumni. Um, and, the, and the alumni are volunteer alumni. And they'll put in 20 to 40 hours a week with you, and there'll be four people on a team. You get a tremendous hands-on uh, kind of instruction and critique and in encouragement to learn how to be a great trial lawyer. Um, they take no salary for this. They do it because people did it for them. Most of them, if not all of them, are former trial team members over the years. Uh, we have a very loyal alumni base that comes out of our trial program. Um, and that alumni base helps you in another way when you get to the end. Um, because of the, the discipline you learn when your time on the team for perhaps two years, if you stay for the full two years there, um, it helps you in approaching the bar. In the last four years, our graduates from the team have had a 100% passage rate on the Illinois bar. That exceeds everything. That exceeds the school, that exceeds the, the bar in Illinois, that exceeds any average of anyone anywhere. There's very few 100%. In addition to that, within six months of graduation, for the last seven years now, our graduates from the program have had a 100% employment rate. And, we, and it's because of the alumni who will call back and say, hey, my firm is looking for someone. Hey, the state's attorney's office has three openings. They'll write letters. They'll, they'll make phone calls. They'll do everything they can to help people who have been our graduates of the team be employed so you can start, so you can start your careers. Um, I think it's, it's one of the highlights and one of the gems of the school. Um, the trophies that you, trophy cases that you see in the picture are those that have been, account, that have been a, uh, acquired by the teams, the various teams, over the last, I guess, 30 some years now, 36 years, 37 years. Um, our latest really great until the year stopped suddenly this year was our balsa team is the midwest national champion this year i'm very very proud of that and this is the fourth time they've done it in five years with that um i guess i'm done and i hope if you want to go to a great urban law school you want to learn how to be a trial lawyer please this is a great place to consider thank you Thanks, Judge Erickson. And now we'll turn it over to Professor Gonzalez to talk about our unique legal clinic. Hi, thanks for joining us today. I'm Rich Gonzalez. I'm the director of the legal clinic. And I can say with confidence that the Chicago Kent Clinic, we call it the CK Law Group, is one of a kind uh, in the nation. And that has nothing to do with me. 
A few decades ago, uh, my predecessor, Gary Lasser, instituted a very unique design. He thought there were two big problems that legal clinics suffered from. One is that the institutions really couldn't afford to attract and retain uh, practicing lawyers who wanted to work uh, with students in law schools, because frankly, it's more expensive for the institutions. Instead of dealing with a classroom full of 50 or 60 students, we're dealing with small numbers, working intensely with them. So schools had a problem paying enough money, frankly, for attorneys to want to stay and do this for a living. That was my own experience back at Ohio State. Uh, I, we had one experienced attorney and then a number of folks who were just a year or two ahead of me and still in touch with these folks. They're my age contemporaries, uh, but they were tremendously experienced practitioners. So that was one problem. Uh, so he designed this fee generating law firm uh, to speak to that problem. Problem number two, the work that most clinics did uh, in the country isn't the kind that provides the kind of work experience that really assists students in getting jobs, building their resumes, appealing to employers. Most legal clinics do fantastic work, things like consumer actions, housing disputes, and this is all important stuff, but it didn't translate into the types of experiences that potential employers are looking for. Now, at CK Law Group, we all do a great deal of pro bono lawyering. We don't turn our back on that. And uh, in fact, after the webinar, please Google Reggie the cat, uh, because we actually went to trial uh, and won a case involving a cat, or perhaps representing the cat's owner that we're very proud of. But we do a lot of pro bono work for people as well as, as cats. And uh, we're unique because this is a fee generating law firm. Uh, we have 11 practicing attorneys. We have two uh, full-time professors who handle our externship program and our ADR and mediation training. So we're a mid-sized Chicago law firm and we practice in the areas that potential employers who will hire you need employment discrimination, divorce, tax, health law, entrepreneurship, criminal defense. And we boast some attorneys who are real giants in their field. And as I say, that's a little bit unusual for law school clinics. For example, Richard Kling, our criminal defense attorney, he's nationally known. He's handled some big, big cases over the years. We always tease him that somebody played him in a movie once. He's that famous. Rhonda DeFridis, who is an extremely prominent family law attorney. So you're working very closely with people who are at the top of their game, and maybe more importantly, they know a ton of people. And those people include prospective employers. So we're able to offer six practice areas that I mentioned, plus we have an off-site uh, intellectual property clinic uh, to Chicago Kent students. And students can choose to take clinic for either three credit hours or four credit hours in a semester. It's up to you. Uh, we do it in the summer as well. And the summer is actually our favorite time because the students, you know, they're not taking four other courses, maybe one other course or maybe none. So we think the summer is the, the best experience. And starting two years ago, we started offering clinic to first year students in the second semester of law school. And students who have finished about half of law school about half of your credits, you're entitled to an Illinois Supreme Court Rule 711 license. And that allows you to practice in the courts. So I've had students present witnesses in federal jury trials. We have had Kent students who have argued in front of the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. And on a just more a week to week basis, in my section, for example, students have extensive client contact, they draft pleadings, they engage in discovery, uh, answering discovery, propounding discovery, uh, preparation for depositions, preparation for trial. So it's a real hands-on experience. And it provides an experience that is attractive to firms and government agencies who are hiring. Uh, 
Plus, as I mentioned, the relationships that we forged with these groups over the years really enables us to uh, routinely find jobs for our students. I just want to mention a couple other aspects of our practical skills training uh, that you might want to know about. Uh, we have a very robust externship program, and I think you folks know what that means. Students spend a semester working at a firm or a government agency. Uh, and again, enhancing your resume and sometimes leading to being hired by that firm or that agency. And we offer a very unique ADR training program that allows students to become certified as mediators. So they actually go over to Circuit Court of Cook County and they mediate real live disputes between parties. Uh, so we think that's a fantastic experience to get in law school. Um, finally, Jennifer mentioned the certificate programs and our clinic is, is tied to a few of them. One of them is ladder. Um, and that is a, a certificate in the litigation, mediation area. And the other one is workplace ladder, which is very popular. Uh, it provides certification in the ever-growing field of employment law. And uh, we're very proud at Chicago Kent that we've been selected, I believe it's the top labor and employment program in the country. So <clears throat> here's why that matters. This has become known, these programs have become known to the practitioners so that we receive contacts routinely from practitioners saying, uh, get us job applicants specifically from students who are part of those programs because they know that those students are going to have an advantage uh, over other random students that they might interview. So they ask us now, send us students who are in one of these certificate programs. And we work closely with Praxis, which is the very innovative skills training program that Jennifer Robbins was telling you about. Uh, there's a lot more detailed information uh, on our website. So please go to our website. And when you go to the clinic portion of the website, please, don't hesitate to phone or email uh, me or any of the other clinic professors, uh, Richard Kling, Rhonda DeFrigas, Heather Harper, uh, Ed Krauss. Uh, they're all happy to talk to you about uh, how this works and how it might fit into uh, to your plans. So uh, I will, uh, as they say on CNN, Nicole, I will flip it back to you. Great, thanks so much. So now we'd like to open up the floor for your questions and you can um, type your questions into the questions box in the webinar software and our panelists would be happy to answer those questions for you. And I think I'll, I'll throw one out just to kick us off while we wait for some questions to come in. And so maybe you can talk a bit about, you know, how do the experiential courses fit into the regular law school curriculum? When do students start to take them? And how do they decide which ones to take advantage of? I, I guess I'll field that one. Uh, so we're actually very fortunate that we have this 1L Your Way uh, concept in the second semester of your first year. So law schools around the country, you will find that the first year curriculum is very, very similar um, from school to school, uh, but not all have the option to take that elective sort of choice of classes in your spring semester. That can be really beneficial in a number of ways. Uh, one, to your point, you can immediately start getting involved in experiential coursework. Uh, so you can actually take clinic, as Professor Gonzalez mentioned, uh, in, in that first year spring semester. Uh, you can also take a variety of courses that are offered. Uh, and even if you're not looking at experiential coursework, I'll tell you one thing that I think is really important uh, about the opportunity to take that elective. And that is that if you know what you want to do already, you think perhaps that you want to be a corporate lawyer, a transactional lawyer, it gives you the chance to take the first class in those sorts of areas in business that would be business organizations. And that course is a prerequisite for many other business courses. So at most law schools, 
you would have to wait until your second year to take the prerequisite basic class in the fall, leaving you only three semesters to take then courses that build on that. Whereas if you ended up <clears throat> taking that prerequisite sort of course in your first year, it would give you an entire two years to take uh, those other classes that have built upon the prereq. So there are a variety of ways to use that, but the answer to the question is you can get involved even in your first year. Uh, and you know by first summer, you could be taking clinic in the summer if that was something you wanted to do. Uh, and so I think students at Chicago Kent get very involved in experiential learning very early. Uh, I have first year students who come into Praxis at the very beginning of their law school career. I've had a few people come into law school knowing that they wanted uh, to work with me on Praxis and came to my office their first day at the law school and signed up and I'm happy to work with those people um, and you know give them advice and start thinking through their strategies. So I think the answer is you can get involved very early. Boy, I second that. And uh, one of the things I hated about the first year of law school uh, that you had no choice. I was used to having choices in the courses I wanted to take, and I didn't like that. So we've started to offer that. The other thing I didn't like about first year of law school was a course called Civil Procedure, where you study the rules to a game that you're never allowed to play. Well, now you can study Civil Procedure, the rules to the game, and play it too. So I think that's Great, so our, our next question is, uh, what's the process to get onto the trial advocacy team? Well, um, there's a few different ways to do that. We do allow 1Ls to try out, and I think um, more and more that's going to be a, a trend because you now have undergraduate trial advocacy across the country. For those of you that are part of it, you can look at surgery.com, which is, of course, the website for undergraduate trial advocacy, and there's competitions all over. There's also high school trial ad competitions, and we have one from the Chicago Public High Schools right here. So kids are coming, students, I should say, are coming to law school now much more prepared and much more enthusiastic about being on the team. Um, we have open tryouts every April, uh, and even with what's going on now, I'm still planning on doing open tryouts this year, and I'll do it electronically, and we'll figure out how to do that, too. Um, also, the other ways of doing that, um, I mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned our intensive courses. We have two intensive courses, one in the summer and one in the winter the week before. The summer one gives us about 40 students. The winter one gives us 24 to 30 students. Um, it's like a boot camp. For eight days, 10 hours a day, you live with a rotating faculty, and we kind of marine-like push you through uh, becoming a trial lawyer. And at the end of the week, you will be standing in front of your friends and your family and your and your little brothers and sisters trying your first jury trial in the, in the Daily Center. Um, it's it's hard, it, but it's meant to be hard, and it, it's, a, it's a great part of the program. From those two classes, I always select at least one, sometimes two. Um, people to be on the team. Uh, the number of people that are on every, come on every year is always dependent upon graduation, obviously. This year we'll, we'll take quite a few because uh, we have 24 or 26 people on the team and I believe we have 14 graduating seniors. So this year, um, between open tryouts, between the, the intensive course, and there's always recommendations from individual trial ed professors in the classes, somebody might say, Hey, Judge, you missed this one. This, this student's really, really good. You've got to give them a try. And so we'll, we'll give individual tryouts, too. So there's multiple ways of, of doing it and coming on. Um, many years ago, we dropped a grade point requirement. And I don't think there is a grade point requirement for even, even from McCord anymore. They've dropped that. I think the way we, we do this right now is what you'll find out is many times um, that student that wasn't didn't love law school all that much turned out to be one of the best trial lawyers in the city, um, one of the top trial lawyers in the city. Both Professor Gonzalez and Professor Robbins and I have seen people who kind of just got out of law school and 10 years later they they had incredible presence in courtrooms, firms, and were winning cases. So that's kind of the, the, the shorthand of how to get onto the team. And I'll just add one thing to that, which is that there actually are a lot of other teams as well. Um, so for instance, uh, I'm the uh, faculty sponsor for the negotiation uh, team. 
so you know if if you're more interested in transactional work and you know you still want the experiential opportunities uh, those students go to ABA competitions uh, and are doing negotiations uh, we have another team uh, that goes to a sports uh, you know sports law sort of competition where um, they basically are doing uh, baseball arbitration um, and that competition is full of sports agents uh, who volunteer and so we have students who are really interested in sports and entertainment law uh, who go to that competition every year so there are a variety of different teams all over campus all have different ways of joining the team um, and so I think it's it's pretty much the case that if you would like to be on a team uh, there's probably a spot for you somewhere um, and you want to pick based on interest and then also uh, you know whatever whatever competitive uh, aspects there are to trying out but there is a lot going on um, and a lot of opportunities there. Great and our um, next we've got, had a couple questions related to the clinic and so it, uh, the questions are how early can you do the clinic and then how does the clinic go about deciding who gets a spot in the clinic and is it difficult to get into the clinic? Well, you can start, now you can start in second semester. So first year students are eligible to be in clinic. Um, that has made it a little tougher uh, to be automatically admitted to clinic because there's just more students applying now in, in a given semester. So there's just, a, just numbers. But, uh, what we found, and I don't know why this is, but over the years, it seems like the interest levels are fairly equally divided, right? It's like you'll have a certain percentage of students who are really interested in criminal, a certain who are in family law, some who want to do employment law. So it, it, somehow it just seems to average itself out so that I'm going to say 85% land in the group they really want to be in. So I don't know why. It just seems to work out that way. Um, you had a second part to that question, though, I think, and I can't remember what it was. Well, it was just, you know, how early, which you had mentioned you can do it as early as the first year, um, and then it was, uh, you know, and how do you decide who gets which clinic, but I think you talked about that, that it just works out. Um, so next question is about externships, and um, how early can students do an externship? When does that process start? Correct me if I'm wrong, Jennifer, I think it's a start of, or right after your first year, I believe. Students will do it in the summer, right after first year. And yeah, I think first, first summer is a very popular time for that. The externships have expanded greatly in, in the last few years. We now have people that have done externships at Homeland Security, um, state police. I mean, it's not, it's not just necessarily the traditional old time externships. Um, Professor Gonzalez's group has has accepted the the kind of the new world of what's out there, and all of a sudden it's just blossomed. It really has. We're also very lucky. You know, Chicago is uh, one of the financial centers in the country, and so we've had a number of students uh, who've also done externships at uh, regulators like Finra. Uh, with uh, exchanges uh, like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, uh, with the National Futures Association, so uh, you know a whole variety of uh, different kinds of financial market regulators, uh, as well as you know many of the big federal uh, agencies have offices in Chicago, uh, and we've had students who've done uh, externships ranging from. You know the SEC to uh, the EPA uh, and all kinds of, of different places so uh, in addition to the courts that you would think of um, and you know the various uh, opportunities associated with uh, the courts there are a number of other different sorts of externships as well that you would find you know a few years ago I taught well, one semester at the University of Iowa Law School a great law school great people but that's when it dawned on me that how lucky we are in Chicago uh, a lot of those students had never been to a federal court or they'd never been to the types of agencies that people externship at uh, at Chicago Kent from our building 
you can go over and drop in on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in the hour break between your classes. I mean, it's all right there within walking distance, and that's pretty amazing. It's our next question is about uh, certificate programs. So, you know, do you need to pick a certificate or focus area? And then if you are interested in a certificate, um, how soon do you have to select one? Uh, so I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so the certificate programs actually, I think, are pretty much a win-win situation. So uh, as far as I know, all the certificate programs are uh, no penalty if you don't finish them. So that's one way in which they really are different from a major that you would think of in college um, because they are completely optional. So for example, if someone enrolls in Praxis, uh, they can really do that at any time. Uh, and the only person who necessarily knows that they enrolled and didn't finish uh, is me. And typically I'm mentoring that person and there'll be a variety of reasons why they don't finish that are well known to me. You know, maybe they really uh, ended up with some hard choice about classes and didn't get enough credits for the certificate. Uh, and that is totally fine. I think all the professors who uh, run certificate programs realize that that happens. Uh, so it's really to students' advantage to sign up, uh, get that mentoring, um, get those course lists, get an idea of what someone in the field thinks that you should be studying if you want to be in that field, and that can help you think about what classes to take. Um, you know, Praxis, we have workshops, so I bring in practitioners, uh, students network with them, they learn about things. I've had sessions on project management, time management, networking, um, you know, and a lot of things that might not uh, necessarily hit your radar in most of your of your classes. Uh, in terms of how late you can enroll, I, I think a good deal of the certificate programs have a limitation that you have to enroll before your third year. Um, you know, and so, uh, you know, it gives you two years to think about it, you know, look into it uh, and decide. But of course, there's no reason not to really. So I always encourage students to uh, to go ahead and enroll as soon as they think that they're interested. But the Jennifer's right, they have all the good things about a major without the bad things about a major. And you know, they always give that advice for job interviews. When the interviewer asks you what you want to do for a living, the correct answer is whatever the interviewer does. And I think if you sit there saying, I want to be an employment lawyer, uh, you're an employment lawyer, that's why I'm here, that's why I am a certificate or that's why I took the intellectual property certificate program. I think you're, you're talking their language. And I'll just add to, there are no GPA requirements as far as I know on any of the certificates either. Uh, so again, unlike a major, you know, it's not like you're trying to get into a certain uh, college or, or certain major. So I think they're pretty much open to everyone. And, and another part of it, it is, we started this, Professor Gonzalez and I, along with another professor, Doug Godfrey, run the trial or the criminal law certificate program. And one of the things that's happened over the last 15 years that we've had it now is the Public Defender's Office and the Cook County State's Attorney's Office, which are major employers. There's there's 800 state attorneys, 600 public defenders. Um, they, in fact, pay, do pay attention. They pay attention to that certificate and they may even ask about it. And by the time you get to the your last semester your two l year you've probably taken a good two thirds if not more of the courses that you would need to take for for our certificate program um, it, 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 it's it's very eclectic it certainly reaches out to many different kinds of people on on both sides it want to be prosecutors defense lawyers or or even public guardians in juvenile court Right. We're coming up on the end of the time for the webinar, so I'm going to have you answer just one more question. And it was about um, for part-time students, you know, are they able to participate in things like trial ad and clinic, particularly part-time oh, evenings? I mean, in terms of clinic, uh, we've always had part-time students. Um, you know, 30 years ago, would that have been as possible? No, but in the age we live in, uh, where so much work is done online. Um, it's it's easy. Um, 
And of course, in the last few weeks, we never see each other anyway. Uh, so uh, it's easy to do most kinds of, uh, of clinic work uh, from a distance. Now, is it cool to go participate in criminal trials and appeals and, and civil jury trials? Sure, and they're going to be back, but there's plenty to do even when they're not going on. And, and as for trial and advocacy, I'm sorry, uh, you, you could no, do go it. Ahead. You, absolutely, you can do it because the trial. There are trial ed courses in the evening um, for those who are working a full time job, and there are trial ed classes at school on in mornings if you have a morning off. The other part of it is to be on the team. It's it's a little bit more limited to be on the team because you probably need an extra twenty hours a week of working to do it, and you wouldn't be on as you wouldn't get as many competitions as a part time student. But we have had part time students instead of getting. Uh, two to four a year or probably being one to two a year. Sorry. Uh, and I was just going to add that, you know, I think that it, it is fair. It's a fair question. Um, and I think that one thing that is really terrific and I have loved about Chicago Kent um, is people's authenticity uh, and, you know, willingness to be honest about various challenges. And so, you know, in that spirit, I will say, I think the hardest decision that part-time students often face in law school is when to leave their full-time job. Uh, is that for a great job offer that they get in their second summer? Uh, is it before the bar exam, after the bar exam? Uh, so many of our part-time students have very serious responsibilities that rely on uh, that full-time job. and. I think that I would just maybe sort of close by saying, I think one of the best things uh, that I've seen at Chicago Gehent is the mentoring by faculty members uh, and the dedication of career services and the number of people around campus that you have access to, to talk about those tough questions, to talk about your individual circumstances and try to help you to make the best decision that you can. Uh, when you do end up facing some of those decisions. And, you know, as Rich said before, I think people are very willing to make themselves available. Uh, I'd be more than happy to, you know, get a call or email from any of you and talk further about your questions. Uh, and I, I think that's true of most people at the school. Don't be shy about asking. Uh, you know, we want you to find the place that is best for you, uh, whether it's with us or, or someplace else. So don't hesitate to reach out. Great. Well, uh, thank you to all of our panelists. We have reached the end of the time for the webinar. We really appreciate everyone joining us for the presentation today. If you do have any remaining questions, please reach out to the Office of Admissions. Um, we're happy to answer those for you or to put you in contact with um, any of our panelists or other students, faculty, and alumni. And we did have a couple of questions that we did not get to um, this afternoon, so the admissions staff will follow up separately on any questions that we didn't have answered. Uh, but again, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to speaking with you uh, further and hopefully seeing you at Chicago Kent this fall. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.